loved one, accessing mental health and substance abuse services in Bucks County. Our presenters today are Nicole Wolf. She is the Director of Training and Education here at Lenape Valley Foundation. And Ana Rosado, she is the Clinical Director at the Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, they'll get started shortly. I just have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we have everybody on mute. If you could stay on mute, that would be great. It allows us to hear the presenters better. Um, if you have questions that come up while our presenters are um, going through their presentation, please type them in the chat. We hopefully will have a few minutes to, at the end of the presentation to um, answer some of the pertinent questions. Also, this session is being recorded. We'll post it up on um, our website for anybody who may miss or if you want to share or if you have to leave early, you can always uh, get this information at a later date and time. So the website is uh, lenapvf.org backslash free workshops. Um, we have recordings from some other workshops that we've, we've done on there as well, and we'll also be posting future workshops. So um, thank you guys all for joining again, and I will let uh, Nicole and Anna get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Nicole Wolf, and thanks, Jess, for the introduction and the housekeeping. Um, I've been with Lenape Valley Foundation for 15 years, um, and for the first 15, I was in the crisis program, uh, started as a crisis worker and um, grew into, into positions with uh, more and more responsibility, most recently being director of all of the crisis programs. So, um, and the role of director of education and training is a newer one for me that I'm very excited about, hopefully being able to have um, an impact outside of a, a single program. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. And Lenape Valley Foundation is a large uh, behavioral health that includes both mental health and developmental disabilities and co-occurring uh, treatment service provider in Bucks County. Uh, we offer every level of care except for inpatient. Uh, and we are the licensed crisis provider in Bucks County. We provide site-based walk-in services in the central and lower part of the county and the mobile crisis service for the entire county. Uh, and we'll get into uh, services a little bit later. Uh, but for now, before we get into the content, I wanna uh, have Anna, my co-presenter, introduce herself. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Anna Rosado. I'm the clinical director for Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission. And um, we are the single county authority for, uh, for Bucks County. So basically there are single county authorities uh, throughout Pennsylvania and we provide funding for individuals who have no insurance or are underinsured for drug and alcohol treatment and co-occurring services. We are also the liaison between let's say uh, the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programming, which is our government agency and our treatment providers. So we do a lot of the monitoring um, of our providers to ensure that services are being provided, quality services are being provided to Bucks County residents. We also provide prevention and inter, um, intervention services. So basically we are the go-to agency and our policy is no wrong door. So when there's ever a question, anything that has substance use related, you contact our agency and someone will be more than uh, happy to help you. Um, if we don't find the answer, if we don't know the answer, we will find the answer for you. So this is a, a picture of our webpage that we have, we ask that individuals go on to get um, all sorts of uh, treatment recovery resources information. Um, it's a way to contact us, our phone number. So please, whenever there's a question, either call us directly or you could uh, go onto our website and see all the services that we are able to fund and we coordinate and collaborate with. And we open and close this presentation with contact information for our agencies. So you'll get a chance to, to hear that information at least one more time. Um, but for now, I just wanna take a second to tell you what we're gonna be doing for the next hour or so. Um, the most important thing is first to know what uh, possible behavioral health, when I say behavioral health, I mean mental health, uh, substance use, um, potentially developmental or intellectual disability, signs and symptoms is something like that could be going on for a person. 
um because you need to kind of know what you're looking at what we're not going to do is go through every single diagnosis and a list of symptoms and diagnostic criteria that's way outside of the scope of this and to be honest you don't need to know any of that to be able to help someone get into uh treatment uh so moving along we'll talk about how to get an assessment, which is typically the first step in accessing any type of service anywhere and definitely in Bucks County. And what are some options for treatment services and how to access those. And then there's all different levels of care within those treatment services. So we'll hopefully give you some information on how to decide where to start. Is it an immediate urgent emergency room level crisis? Or is it something that maybe we can take a minute and, and, and uh, set up an appointment uh, for something in the near future. So the first thing we have to talk about is what it looks like when someone is struggling. I always start, you know, we always start with early signs of struggle because early intervention is critical for recovery from either a mental illness or a substance abuse. So if you can notice that someone is struggling early on in their symptom development, there's a much greater chance that um, they will need less intense treatment and that that treatment will be more effective more quickly and that the outcome will be um, better, more positive. So when someone starts out struggling with a mental illness or a substance abuse issue, it it, they, it, either mental health or substance abuse impacts every area of a person's life, the way they think, the way they feel, the way they behave, the way they relate to people, their, their relationships, their um, ability to attend work, school, and their daily activities. So um, there's all different ways that it can, that it can manifest. And um, in general, uh, the more symptoms you see or the more intense the symptoms are, the more concerned we would be. So earlier on, we're going to look at physical. How, have, how has their physical appearance changed? Do they seem to be more tired than usual? Maybe a little more disheveled or more unkempt than usual? If you notice my words, there's a, a change, you see. So if we're talking about... Um, <laughs> I have a middle schooler who I way too often have to ask if he brushed his teeth or not. <laughs> so if you have a person in your life that has kind of always been that and it's always been an issue for them, you know, then that's different than someone who maybe was always kind of sharp sharply dressed, hair done, uh, you know, maybe makeup on, whatever it might be. And now all of a sudden they seem a little bit more unkempt. Uh, that might be a little concerning. It could be just that they're having a rough time at work or school. If they're in college, it's finals week and they're losing sleep. Or it could be that, you know, maybe they're working on a really tough project at work or some big change. It might not necessarily, but again, that comparison. Um, weight loss too, uh, especially sudden weight loss or weight loss that a person is not necessarily openly saying they're on a new diet with a goal of losing weight. That's something to be concerned of. Um, losing interest in activities, hobbies, um, being more angry or irritable than usual could be a, an early sign. Also, not being as reliable for appointments or commitments um, or being secretive about their movements and, and what they're doing uh, and difficulty concentrating, being indecisive are all um, early signs that someone could be struggling. Anna, was there something you wanted to add here? Yeah, uh, really quickly uh, with the angry and irritability, um, you'll see a significant change pretty quickly. Because if somebody's using substances, they come home angry. They might go upstairs, come downstairs, all of a sudden happy. Now, it could be they had a good conversation with someone. But when you see a pattern and a combination of symptoms, then it's something like a, a, a red flag. You're like, wow, you know, do I need to do a room search to find out what's going on? The secretive, again, it depends on, you know, if you're dealing with an adolescent, yes, adolescents like to be secretive. But again, it's the pattern, you know, and that's why, you know, with dealing with individuals and all of a sudden they're hiding secrets, uh, 
locking their door when they don't lock the door, all these things is, is a combination of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll move on to when things might be getting a little worse. So, um, and, and again, with the early signs and with these like kind of more developed signs, the more you see or the pattern or most importantly, a drastic change in a person is, is what might make you think that it's not just something situational, but something a little more going on, something a little deeper. So again, that declining hygiene, maybe unexplained cuts or bruises, things like that. Maybe they're just going through a clumsy spurt or you know, maybe they're engaging in non-suicidal self-injury, some kind of self-mutilation, cutting or, 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 or hurting themselves intentionally. Um, the emotional piece, just noticeable sadness and we, you know, we call it flat affect, not really showing the typical range of emotions that a person would. Um, I would say probably on this slide, one of the things that I think is the most concerning is hopelessness and despair. Um, hopelessness and despair are that, that sense that nothing can go right for me. There's nothing I can do to change my situation. There's nothing anyone else can do to help me or change my situation. That sort of expression of thoughts and emotions are the precursors to suicidal thoughts. Um, and, and, the, and that that is the only way to end that level of emotional pain. So if someone is expressing those thoughts of hopelessness and despair, very, very concerning. Um, bouts of rage or extremely rapid mood swings um, within the same day, uh, like Anna was mentioning on the last slide, you know, they go up to their room and come back down and they're, and, um, you know, suddenly they're happy. Uh, that's concerning. Um, also flying into a rage over what seems like something minor can be, can be concerning isolation or withdrawing from family and friends, absenteeism or presenteeism. Um, I recently heard this word a a as a word. I understood the concept, but didn't hear it as a word, but I like it. It is the idea that someone is showing up and they're physically there, but they're not really there in their mind or in their heart, in their emotions. So that, you know, I'm here in body, but not in mind and spirit. Um, so, uh, that kind of thing can be concerning. Odd, erratic behavior, extreme hyperness energy. Um, again, that person who's always been sort of a little silly or off the wall or had a, had a um, uh, eclectic sense of humor or whatever, we might not be so worried here. But if someone suddenly changed and, and they are um, especially energetic, um, or the opposite, especially sedentary, and they've always been an active person running from one thing to the next. Again, it's that change, something that's odd or different for them. Um, and what could be going on inside the person's mind? A lot of maybe self-blame, self-criticism, racing thoughts. Um, it might look like their mind is going blank. You know, it could be it could be just that they have their mind on something else, or it could be that they're distracted by racing thoughts. It could be that maybe they're starting to have hallucinations or delusions, and that's what's making them seem distracted or, or like their mind is blank. Um, it could be any number of things. Uh, but the point is that that's what you'd be seeing and noticing, and, and it would be causing concern. Anna, did you want to? Yeah, the one thing I wanted to mention a couple of things um, the cuts and bruises, like if they've been drinking and falling a lot, or they're injecting substances and have black and blues, or abrasions around the mouth, because if they're huffing, many times you see abrasions around the mouth, or if they're smoking drugs, emotional, um, you know, the increased sadness, hope, because they couldn't be feeling this because they've been using and now they're crashing uh, from their substance use. Um, Dipping out, so that's when somebody's been using opiates or heroin, heroin uh, pain medication or something, and they look like they're just napping. Um, it could be that they're like kind of like pretty hard to wake up. They're they're like this on odd times, like they're supposed to be sitting down, you know, eating dinner, and all of a sudden you see them dipping out or something like that. So those are just behaviors that you kind of want to, you know, or flashes and say, what's going on here? Okay. 
So we'll keep moving. Now, so now that you know what to look for or look out for or may have already seen, and that's why you decided to join this presentation today, um, now we'll talk about what are the options. Uh, so I'll start with a couple of slides on Lenape Valley Foundation. As I mentioned in the beginning, we're a large provider of behavioral health services. You can see the list of all of our, these are our sort of outpatient and community-based services. I have another slide that's all about crisis services for if we're moving into the worsening signs, but if we're still in the early signs and we're thinking that, you know, it's, I can make an appointment and set up some services, these are the options. So we have a robust outpatient service, which offers therapy, psychiatry, um, partial hospitals, sometimes people refer to as a day program. It's uh, several groups throughout the day. Um, and that's, that's a pretty intense level of care. That's for someone who's really struggling, but they don't necessarily need to go into the hospital, but they need a daily level of treatment. Transitional outpatient is sort of a step down from that where it's one group a few times a week. And it's like a bridge between the hospital or partial hospital program and the outpatient program, which is more, um, you know, maybe weekly or biweekly appointments with a therapist and maybe monthly appointments with a psychiatrist. Uh, we also have case management and supports coordination. They're essentially the same service, but on two different spheres. Case management is where the primary issue is mental health. Supports coordination is when the primary issue is an intellectual disability. But essentially what they do is they help make sure that a person has all the different community supports they need to be successful and live in recovery um, without an intensive level of treatment. Um, early intervention and IBHS are services for kids. Um, early intervention is zero or birth to um, age three. And IBHS, which used to be called BHRS or wraparound, that stands for intensive behavioral health services. Uh, that's for kids from four and up who um, need a pretty intensive community-based level of care, either at home or in the school to maintain um, their, their placement there, that there's a lot of support to make sure the kid can be successful in, in their environments. Assertive Community Treatment Team is a community-based uh, service for adults. Uh, those are for folks who have really struggled to um, be in the community and maintain their recovery on their own without going into higher levels of care repeatedly, especially the hospital. Um, and so this is an intensive, it's meds, therapy, case management. There's a career specialist, um, a drug and alcohol specialist, if necessary, can, can um, touch base with a person regularly, sometimes daily, depending on the person's needs. Um, and then we have our residential services as well. Um, for someone who needs that level of support and our crisis services, which I will uh, get into on the next slide. So Lenape Valley provides adult and children's mobile crisis services. Um, the mobile team operates across the entire county. Now, if someone who lives outside of Bucks County is having a crisis in Bucks County, the mobile team can help with that. But if someone who lives in Bucks County is outside of Bucks County at the moment, they can't operate outside of Bucks County. So they would have to come back into the county for the mobile team to engage in person. Now, as a result of COVID, sort of that, the, as, as many horrible things as that has brought to our world, uh, the one thing that it, is a positive thing that it brought is that we have adapted to virtual um, modes of engaging with people. So we've really developed our telephone support. We can do Zoom uh, sessions or um, even evaluations. The mobile team can do an evaluation over Zoom or over the telephone. So um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be in person, but at the times, that it does need to be in person. The teams are operating Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, there's three staggered teams with our highest level of staffing being uh, that sort of after school, after work hours of 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. where we have all three teams 
operating during those hours. Um, they do cover the entire county, so there are delays. Um, the mobile team doesn't have uh, the ability to teleport to locations. Bucks is a large county, so there's drive time and, and coordination time and things like that. Uh, but in those overnight hours of 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., we do have one mobile crisis worker on call. Um, so if there is a, you know, a pretty bad situation and police are involved, the police can call us and we'll come out um, to them. If a, if, if a general community member calls, we would probably have the, um, that mobile crisis worker respond with police if it needed to be in person and couldn't be managed over the phone by a, a telehealth. And then on the weekends, we have a, um, a one team on Saturday and one team on Sunday from 9 a.m. until 9.30 p.m. And then on call outside of those hours on, from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Um, so we are available. Referrals can come in 24-7, 365, and the number's right there. Uh, if on the times that the mobile team is not operating or if they are all busy and otherwise engaged, the calls drop to our site-based crisis team. So the phones are always answered. So what does the mobile team do? And honestly, this question is, what does the, the site-based crisis team do? Because it's essentially the same, whether it's mobile or crisis. Um, the most important function of crisis is to do an assessment to determine level of care. What is needed at this moment based on what's going on and what um, other supports does the person have in their environment? And the questions they're asking are, is this person safe? Is the community safe? Um, and it, or is there an ability to create a safety plan that's viable? And um, if the answer to that is yes, then we'll look at a, a lower level of care, maybe an outpatient referral. If the answer to those questions are no, then we're probably going to be looking at an inpatient level of care at that point. Um, but we can do crisis counseling to help figure that out, that crisis prevention planning, also safety planning, same thing, um, coordination of care, making referrals to uh, different um, community programs. And then also, if there is a need, um, crisis can does facilitate involuntary commitments if, if that becomes necessary. So the person's an imminent risk to themselves or others as a result of a mental illness um, and they're refusing, they're, they, they have declined offers uh, to seek help voluntarily. We can, we can look at the involuntary process and the crisis workers can help with that. That's outside of the scope of this presentation, um, but if you want any information on that and how that process works, please feel free uh, to reach out. You'll have my contact information at the end of this. And this is my last slide before I turn it over to Anna. I just wanna make sure that um, you know where the site-based crisis centers are for walk-in. So in Central Bucks, uh, you would enter through the emergency room of Doylestown Hospital, and I have the phone number listed there. Um, depending on what's going on with the person, if there are no medical needs at that time and they're voluntary, um, they don't have to become an emergency room patient. It's just you go in the same door as if you're going to the emergency room and you'll, you know, when you get on site, you'd be directed toward the, the Lenape Valley area of the emergency room. Uh, lower Bucks, uh, at Lower Bucks Hospital, there are two options, 24-7, 365, you can walk into Lower Bucks Hospital emergency room and ask to speak with Lenape Valley Crisis or sign in to um, engage with our services. If you choose that option, the, you do become an emergency room patient at Lower Bucks and Lenape Valley Foundation acts as a consultant to the emergency room position, physician. Um, however, Monday through Friday from around 8 or 9 a.m. Um, until 10 p.m., I, I, I prefer to say 9 because if it gets close to 10, you'll probably be directed over to the emergency room. Uh, but from about 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., we have the center behind Lower Bucks Hospital where it is a walk-in service. Again, that's for folks who are voluntary, um, not um, extremely intoxicated um, and have no medical needs because we don't have medical staff there uh, to assess. It, it's just crisis staff. Um, but we could do the assessment, make a level of care recommendation, all of that. And it's just a much uh, 
more calm, welcoming environment than an emergency room. An emergency room isn't meant to be calm and welcoming. It's, it's, it's meant to be for emergencies. Um, and also that building is the home of the Lodge Crisis Residential Program, um, which is an alternative to inpatient uh, that we opened about a year and a half ago at that site. Uh, and if you think that that's uh, something that you're interested in, the way to access that service is by getting a crisis assessment first. So that's the first step. And then for anyone who's tuning in from the upper part of the county, uh, it's not Lenape Valley Foundation that provides the walk-in services up there, it's Penn Foundation. And those services can be accessed at Grandview Hospital Emergency Room, okay? So I'm gonna turn it over to Anna to talk about accessing substance use treatment. Oh, you're muted. Yes, you unmuted myself. 2020 and 2021 apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so with the drug and alcohol system, you know, like Nicole said, Bucks County is, is, is a pretty big county. So with um, the first step in accessing drug and alcohol treatment or co-occurring treatment, let's say you have somebody who has you know, is, is using substances, but also has mental health um, diagnoses, they could go to through the drug and alcohol system to, to try to get services for both, um, depending on the situation. So the first step is accessing drug and alcohol assessment, and that is conducted by at a provider site that is contracted with either the county or with the insurance carrier, because with uh, each insurance, it's a little bit different. Next slide. So, um, so if you have private insurance, you know, in the back of your private insurance card, there's information that says um, to access substance use, mental health or behavioral health, they will give you a phone number. So you give them a call and you let them know that you need a drug and alcohol assessment. If an individual has Medicare, or Medicare works a little bit differently. So uh, for inpatient level of care, they need, they need to, lead, to meet the criteria for hospital level. So that means that they have to have a medical um, diagnosis, like something's going on with like their high blood pressure that's unmanaged or um, some other severe medical case, and they have to go to Valley Forge or Eagle Hospital. Uh, for outpatient services, they can go to Family Services, Penn Foundation, or Penn Dell. Um, what we do with the county is if an individual needs a level of care and they have Medicare, we may do, uh, we do individual case-by-case -case situations to see if they, we can provide county, um, uh, county assistance. Um, because we understand that sometimes an individual may have Medicare but may not meet the criteria to meet one of those levels of care. So we ask that, again, if you have Medicare and you're seeking help, you could contact our office and we could help uh, coordinate the system. If you have medical assistance, um, Magellan or no insurance, then you, have a, you could have an assessment at one of our provider networks. So we have provider networks throughout the county. Um, so we have, uh, next slide. So for upper bucks, let's see, I'm not sure which slide is next. Okay, lower bucks, we're gonna start with lower bucks. So with lower bucks, we have Gadencia Lower Bucks located, it's right on the campus of Lower Bucks Hospital. Matter of fact, it's right by Lenape Valley Crisis. So it's a 24 assessment site. Um, so regardless of the time you go, you could have uh, an assessment, it's walk-in. Because of COVID, they've done some adjustments and they're able to provide telehealth assessments as well. So when you call Gadencia looking for an assessment, they will ask you a couple of questions or uh, you are able to uh, request a telehealth assessment, but they're walk-in. So you don't need an appointment, which is great. But if you do need an appointment or you do need a telehealth assessment, you could just give them a call and let them know. Next slide. Um, so for Central Bucks, we have SOAR Corporation in Warminster. Again, they do walk-in and telehealth assessments um, and they're located on Lewis Drive. Uh, now with, uh, with Gadencia Lower Bucks, they do residential treatment as well. So if a person comes in and they need outpatient, Gadencia will coordinate with an outpatient provider to ensure that person meets that level of care. Now, SORG only has outpatient, um, general outpatient. So if somebody needs residential level of care, they will coordinate to find an, uh, a provider to ensure that person gets a transition to an inpatient provider, which would be like a detox, a rehab, a halfway house um, levels of care. And they also offer medication assisted treatment with methadone and uh, Suboxone. Next. Then with Opera Bucks, we have Penn Foundation, the recovery center. So Penn Foundation is also, you know, does the crisis and mental health, but they also have a recovery center where they do um, assessments. 
They offer outpatient and inpatient levels of care. They also offer medication assisted treatment through Suboxone and Vivitrol. They do not do methadone. Um, so they offer walk in hours and they are also doing telehealth assessments. Now, one of the requests is that they call, if you're going to go in for an assessment, call them first because what they'll do is they'll do a screening and we'll be able to triage the case to say, oh, this is an emerging case. You need to come in right in so we can do an assessment or do the phone assessment. Or, you know, this is something that you might need an assessment, uh, but it's not such a, an emergency that they were able to schedule your assessment. Next slide. So throughout our, um, our county, um, we have services, recovery supportive services that are available to individuals. Now, um, we have BCARES, which is a Bucks County Assess, Refer, Engage and Support. And these are individuals that work with our hospitals. So each of our hospitals have a BCARES unit that's assigned to them, whereas an individual comes in through the ER with uh, a medical condition, but are also using substances or are a survivor of overdose the ER or the hospital will contact BCARE so they, they can come in, do a screening, and try to coordinate services to get that person into a residential level of care from a step down from the hospital. They, they, we try to avoid getting going them, have them go home and then go to a treatment provider. We try to do that seamless um, situation. So if somebody is an overdose survivor, um, hey, where did the BCARE slide go? If somebody is an overdose survivor, they are able to get free... Um, three days worth of funding. Um, then we have BCARES Family Connect, which is a family peer-to-peer -peer services. So many, um, as we know with substance use, the substance use affects the whole individual and the family. Um, so it is a systems uh, issue. So BCARES Family Connect uh, through this email will connect a family to another family who has a similar experience. So let's say you have a son or daughter who's struggling and you call and you email BCARES Family Connect and say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I have a son who's struggling. I need some help. They will look at a family who, um, who has experience with a child and connect you. And they offer one-on-one -on -one services. So either they'll email you, they'll text you, they'll call you, they'll meet you in the community, uh, given both COVID guidelines. But it's a peer-to-peer, one-on-one. -peer, um, so um, that is also available like through Al-Anon and Nar-Anon. But those are more group settings. So this is all first individual. We have the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania. It is one of our provider agencies that offers intensive case management, task case management, mom's case management, which is for pregnant women and women with children. Um, so there's case management services available to individuals uh, who are who have substance use diagnoses, regardless if they're in treatment or not. These are supportive services that will connect individuals to support them with the ultimate goal of getting them into treatment or recovery network. Um, the recovery centers we have are Lower Bucks. Um, it's the Southern Bucks Recovery Center, and that's a drop-in center. And a full array of services are available there, as well as uh, support meetings, uh, yoga, recovery coaching, certified recovery specialists, employment, um, help, resume writing. So it's a great center where individuals could go and say, I need some help, and they'll kind of see what you need and connect you to services. Next slide. We have um, mobile engagement services through Penn Foundation, and they connect with the families to try to engage somebody into treatment. We have two centers of excellence in, um, in Bucks County. It's Family Services and Penn Foundation. They're also case management services. Um, and all we have many different levels of care and different sites that offer different treatment as well. So Family Services, Penn Foundation, Living Grin, um, Liberté, Good Friends, SOAR, all these are treatment sites within the county that can provide different levels of care for individuals. And then in addition, they have some other supportive services. Uh, Bucks County has a network of recovery houses that are part of the uh, Bucks County Recovery House Association. There are some uh, recovery houses that are not a part of the association, but we always recommend recovery houses that are part of this association because they are being monitored through probation parole, through our agency to ensure that there's quality um, living environment for individuals who especially are in early recovery. So many times people step down from a, from a rehab into supportive living. So if you're a family member and, and, and struggling with an individual and you don't know what to do, one, contact our agency that we could try to help you with anything and then explore what are some of the living environments. So there's halfway house, which is a treatment level care, but there's also a recovery house, which is self-pay but it is structured supportive living. Next slide. 
Um, so Act 53, drug and alcohol treatment is totally voluntary. Um, uh, so, but if you have an adolescent between the age of 12 and 17, there's a Act 53 where you can petition the court for the individual to be seen uh, in front of a judge. And the process is pretty quickly. Um, so again, contacting our office so that we can help coordinate the assessment to occur um, via the judge, in front of the judge, because we have an assessor at the courtroom. Um, the, you know, the parent has to petition uh, uh, some paperwork through Doylestown to start the process rolling. But again, first point of contact is, I'm sorry, please. <laughs> I'm a fast talker, I'm Puerto Rican, and I talk with my hands, so I'm gonna slow it down. Um, so the first point of contact for Act 53 is to call us. It's 215-444-2730, so we can help walk you through the process. Next slide. These are some self-help organizations that we have. There's phone numbers. If you look online, um, many times there are access to services, access to different 12-step uh, meetings. Because of COVID, many of them are virtual, uh, but they are still in-person meetings. Um, we have NAMI as well, um, support groups that do more of the co-occurring. They help support the mental health as well as the recovery. They do family support. It's a great organization. Um, but again, if you ever have any questions, if you need uh, more answers, just contact our agency. We are always very open to help and connect with anybody. Next slide. Uh, BPAIR, it's a, agent, it's a program that we have with police departments where an individual could go into the police department and say, I need help. And they will co coordinate uh, a navigator to get this person to an assessment or try to get a VITA telehealth assessment. I know it's contrary to like, why would you go to a police department? Because you won't get in trouble as long as you don't have a warrant in accessing uh, some help through the police departments and they're throughout the county. Next slide. Our medication take back, please do not dispose of your medications, uh, either flushing through the toilet or throwing them out. Um, one of the biggest ways that especially adolescents get hooked on drugs is through the family's medicine cabinet. So it's not only yours, but your grandparents, uh, neighbors, anybody involved. So please, we have a big take back, I believe it's April 24th, where you could get rid of the medications. Uh, we have drop boxes throughout the county. The police stations have drop boxes the uh, Doylestown Courthouse, and these drop boxes are anonymous. You put your medications, in a, preferably in a little baggie, and you can put them um, from there, and the DEA takes care of them. Next slide. Um, Narcan, um, Narcan uh, helps prevent um, deaths from an overdose. So there's ways to get free Narcan, and this slide helps you how to get Narcan through the mail because of COVID. Um, so there's online training and you're able to get Narcan mailed to you. And if you see the website, it's www.nextdistro.org slash Pennsylvania will give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to get the Narcan via um, the mail. Next slide. Okay. And just so as a done? reminder, okay. I know we're, we are going through a lot of information and resources here, but this will be posted on the lenapvf.org website. Uh, backslash free workshops, a recording of this. Uh, so you'll be able to have access to all the information and honestly, a Google search of the Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission or Lenape Valley Foundation will get you there if you, if you don't feel like watching the whole recording again. Um, and you'll have uh, our phone numbers. If there's anything that you're going to write down in this uh, whole entire presentation, it would be, I would say the mobile crisis number, the 877-435-7709 and Anna's office number. Uh, do you want to remind them of that again? The number? Yeah, but I'm going to type it in the, um, that in the chat. Great. In the chat. Yeah. So I, I could um, able number to her um, agency, the main number. Those are two um, really mm -hmm. important numbers to have. So now um, I did see a question in the chat about, you know, I think my family member might be uh, struggling with mental health, but where do I even start? Well, the first thing you have to decide is, is this an urgent, emergent situation that we need help with right this second? Um, and here are some things to think about. One, immediate physical safety. It seems like a little bit of a no brainer, but when, drugs are involved or the stigma of mental health. Um, 
sometimes people are hesitant to call uh, for help to call 911. Um, but if someone is bleeding, they're unconscious or in and out of consciousness, disoriented, confused, any one of those things, um, it's really important to call 911. And at the very least, have them checked out either by the medics or by an emergency room, ideally. Um, and if you need to call 911 in Bucks County, ask for a CIT officer. That stands for Crisis Intervention Team. And Anna and I are both on the Crisis Intervention Team Task Force for Bucks County. We provide officers with 40 hours of training that's you know lecture based it's interactive it's there's role plays that we we give them every like a lot of what they need to know to be able to help identify if a situation has a behavioral health issue driving it um, and to guide the person to appropriate resources um, so now not every single officer in Bucks County is CIT trained, but every single township in Bucks County does have at least one CIT officer in it. Um, I can't guarantee that that officer is going to be on shift when you call or not otherwise involved, but it can't hurt to ask for a CIT officer if you ever have to call 911. Um, so physical safety, we need to talk about. Then we got to think about the level of urgency. If any of these things are, of, are a factor in, in where you're at at the moment, either if they are overdosing or have recently overdosed, if they have attempted suicide or are really talking about suicide, um, talking about hurting others or being physically assaultive or, or, or really combative, not again, not just verbally yelling and angry, but becoming physically. Um, or if they are experiencing psychosis to the point where they're unable to care for themselves. So they're, they might be hallucinating or having delusional thoughts and it has gotten so intense that maybe they're not eating right, they're not drinking water, they're not dressing appropriately for the weather, they're not attending to their, to their daily basic needs. Um, those things are all pretty urgent crisis situations that need to be addressed. Now, when someone is talking about suicide, that is really hard to ask people about. I just want to acknowledge that right now. Um, if you're here, if you're joining in to this presentation because you're a professional in the field, you may have asked this question lots of times. If you're joining as a family member, maybe you asked it, maybe you never have. And I can tell you that it is a difficult question to ask someone, even for people who have been in the field for ages, been in the mental health field for ages. The words kind of get caught in your throat when you're, if you're worried about someone that you care about um, being suicidal. Um, so I wanna take a second just to acknowledge that what I'm about to say, I realize is a difficult ask, but it is really important that if you think that someone that you care about is having thoughts of suicide, that you ask the questions as they appear on the slide. Have you been having thoughts of suicide or have you been having thoughts of killing yourself? It's really important to ask it directly so that you get accurate information back from the person. If you ask the question like, you're not having thoughts of suicide, are you? You're begging the question. You're telling them what you want the answer to be. If you ask the question, are you thinking about hurting yourself? That's not the same question as, are you thinking about killing yourself or are you thinking about suicide? It's really important to ask it just like that. Um, and then if the answer is yes, that will probably take your breath away for a second. If it's someone who you care about and love, just be prepared for that. Um, but it is also really important to ask some follow-up questions. You know, have you thought about how you would do it? Have you thought about when you would do it? Have you gathered the things that you need to follow through on that plan that you've developed? And have you thought about any other ways that you might do it? These questions can and do save lives, even though they're extremely difficult to ask, but it, it is important. Um, that you ask them in that way. Now, if the answers to those questions are no, you know, they, maybe you're worried, maybe they're, they do seem a little hopeless and despair, but they say, no, I'm not suicidal. I haven't thought about that. I wouldn't go that far. I'm just really, really desperate, or I'm really um, sad about this, or I'm so sad and I don't understand why I'm so sad. 
um, then that's different than if someone says, yes, I've thought about it. And I know that I, I, I haven't been taking um, my heart medication and I've been piling it up. And I know that if I take it all in one shot, I can, you know, I will die and I'm going to do it tomorrow when no one's home. I mean, that is a very detailed, high level of planning. And that definitely ratchets up the concern and will, would probably require an urgent crisis assessment um, at that moment. Um, so, but outside of that, let's say someone is there, you know, they're saying, no, I'm, not, you know, maybe I've had that thought now and again, but I would never act on it. I just am, am really, really sad. Um, or, or anxious or whatever they might be feeling, angry all the time, um, then maybe it doesn't necessarily have to be let's call 911 or run to the emergency room. It could be let's call mobile crisis and see how they can help us with this. Or if substances are a factor, it might be let's call Gadenzia or let's call Penn Foundation or let's call the, bug, the Drug and Alcohol Commission. I know that Bucks County has a ton of resources on this. You know, I heard about this place called Lenape Valley Foundation. They have a ton of resources for behavioral health. Maybe they can help guide us in the right direction and decide what step I need to take. Um, whether you're supporting them to make the call on their own, that's the best option. <laughs> um, or if you're, you know, um, sitting with them and you make the phone call and they're sitting right there, it doesn't matter what, what, how it happens um, as long as the call is made. Now there are privacy laws it, um, and Anna can talk a little bit about how mm -hmm. they impact drug and alcohol treatment in mental health. We can't disclose any information without the person's consent unless there is an immediate threat to their safety or the safety of the community. Um, then we can, release just enough information to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, but it, it's a tough conversation to have. And, and as long as you can give the person, it's always better for the person to be voluntary, empower them to do this on their own. But as I mentioned before, there are options. If they're an immediate threat and they're not voluntary, you just call Lenape and we'll walk you through that process. Um, but that empowerment could look like you know, I kind of think we should call somebody. Um, do you want to call them? Do you want me to call them? Do you want to, you know, do you, do you want to call them and I'll sit here right next to you? Um, either way, the phone call is being made, but they're making the decision of what that looks like. And that is extremely powerful and empowering. Um, the other, the final factor in terms of how to decide where to start is what's the support available to them? We have a wide range in the audience today here. So um, if you're a family member and you're, you know that you're gonna be there and be able to be with them, you know, kind of step-by-step while they're getting connected to whichever level of service and kind of checking in with them, making sure they're safe and things haven't gotten any worse, then that actually ratchets down the risk a little bit and allows you a little bit of space to breathe and not necessarily say we have to get to emergency room right now. Um, but if that's not the case and there's no one there and the person is maybe thinking about some um, pretty concerning things or behaving in a way that is very concerning and dangerous, then that ratchets up the level of risk. And so we would want to have a more immediate um, action of maybe uh, maybe seeing where the mobile team is and if they're able to get there quickly. If not, maybe going to one of the walk-in centers, um, whether it's mental health or drug and alcohol, um, and, and doing something sooner rather than waiting. Anna, did you wanna add anything to that? I do. Um, I, where to start? So if you have a concern, I think it's important one is to realize that there's so many people that are in the same boat. The stigma associated with substance use is, is, is very sad and, it's, and it creates a barrier, but you're not alone. That's the first thing to remember is that you're not alone. If you may feel very lonely, you might feel like, oh, it's my fault, whatever, the guilt, the shame. You have to look for resources. So reaching out to Al-Anon, and I'll send some information out to the group. Um, maybe I could get uh, one of our flyers sent out to the group as an email so that you have this information. Um, but reaching out to your supports to find out what's going on because 
if you're going to address it right away, you have to have a plan on how to address it. So if you do find drugs, if they do say yes that I'm using, then a lecture is not going to work. Like Nicole said, well, okay, well, how can we, how can I help you address this? Do you have about an, you know, an assessment or there's resources out there? Um, being involved as a family session, it, you know, getting involved with treatment. Don't, it's not, the issue is just not that person, it's a systems issue. So looking at the family, how can we as a, a family support? And many times by time families look for treatment, so much dam damage has been done because they've already lost trust and there's anger and resentment. So the earlier you start the process and getting involved in, in this, in the recovery, the better off the, um, that person and the family will be because you'll learn boundaries. You'll learn how to address some of the questions. What, the, you know, do I give them money? No, you don't give them money. You know, you help support them. So get to pay rent or anything like that. that, but I wouldn't, you know, that's one thing we wouldn't give them money. So that's really important to remember that you're not alone in this and reaching out really should be like numbers. Step number one, to have the education and support in place. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I agree. Um, I'm going to, so basically the last couple of slides are just contact information for both of our agencies. And I'm seeing some questions come in through the chat that um, I'm going to attempt to answer here. Uh, but I'll leave this slide up for a little bit and then I'll put up Anna's agency's information. And then the very last slide is contact information for Anna and I, in case you have questions specific for us. Um, what I would say is you see our, our Facebook and Twitter and Instagram information and, and the website. If please don't put any urgent requests on those. Those are not monitored 24 seven. They are not urgent. The crisis hotline or the other crisis numbers that I gave before are the ones to call in an emergency or an urgent situation. Um, but while um, we're having that information up on the screen, so one of the questions is about referrals for adults with autism. And there is a really good place in Bucks County called Potential Inc. Potential Inc. And if you just Google search Potential Inc, I'm sorry, I don't have the number off the off the top of my head and I have too many screens going to do a Google search right now. But if you do that for now, just write down Potential Inc. Um, and they provide services for people with autism of all ages, children and adults. Um, the other question, oh, Jess put the link in the chat. Awesome, thanks Jess. Um, so, Another person asked, how do you convince someone that they need help when they're in denial? This is a hard one. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is back to when we talked about warning signs, we talked a lot about observable behaviors, things that you're seeing, things that you notice about how a person has changed. And I would say presenting those things rather than uh, something along the lines of, you know, you're just not right, or I think you're depressed, or I think you have an, I think you have a drug addiction. Um, those statements elicit defensiveness, right? Um, whereas it's a little harder to be defensive when. Um, you are stating what you specifically see. So I've noticed that lately you have been, you know, not really taking care of yourself in the same way that you used to. Um, I remember always being, you know, very impressed at how your, your hair was done and you always had the sharpest clothes. And now the last couple of times I saw you, um, I, I just, you know, it seems like maybe you're a little maybe a little disheveled and I'm concerned. Is there something I can do to help? Is there something going on? Um, something like that. I, so the, the sort of uh, <laughs> um, template would be, I've noticed that fill in the blank, what you're observing and I'm concerned and I'd like to help. Is there something going on? Would you like to talk? Um, some kind of supportive statement. And then even more important than at approaching the situation and asking the question is giving the person space to answer and just sort of active listening, taking a step back. Um, 
being non-judgmental about what's going on. A lot of times the reason why a person is in denial is because they could be embarrassed, ashamed. Um, they could be afraid that they're going to be locked away or something like that. So uh, just any conversation that you have, look at it as planting the seeds, even if it doesn't go anywhere in that first moment. If it's not an urgent, I need to call 911 situation, look at it as planting a seed. I think if you um, you could just Google motivational interview in, motiva motivational interviewing strategy. For, oh my goodness, I can't speak. Motivational interviewing strategies. Um, you could do YouTube. They show you videos on how to do it. But you know, sometimes people will not. When someone's in denial, many times they don't realize how bad it is or um, the negative uh, implications of either they're not addressing mental health or using. So sometimes helping them understand like, you know, you love this job, but you, you keep on uh, waking up late or you keep on missing work, you know, how can I help you prevent you losing this job since you like it so much? You know, sometimes not that direct, like, like Nicole said, saying, well, you know, you're just an addict. Please, you know, think of person-centered language, making sure that you know, you're not labeling individuals, calling them somebody a junkie, yeah, I hate that word with all my heart, <laughs> or calling them an addict. If you're a person with a substance use issue or a person with a mental health issue like or diagnosis. So trying to educate again before you confront someone will make the difference too. Because you want they don't you don't want them to see you as your as the enemy. You want them to see you as a as somebody who's gonna support them. Are there other questions? I didn't see any other questions in the chat. Um, we have about two minutes before one o'clock. If there are any additional questions. Uh, Jess also put um, another resource, Autism Cares Foundation in Southampton. Um, the Potential Inc. is in Newtown, so fairly centrally located. Um, all right. Otherwise, you have our contact information, you have our agency's contact information, um, crisis numbers were in one of the slides. I'll throw them in the chat too uh, for lower. There was so much information in these slides. I think what we'll do is if we don't post all the slides, we'll definitely post all the resources that were included in the slides onto the website because that would have been a lot of note taking. Yeah. <laughs> You've yeah. got all those numbers down. I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, very good. Very and just remember, good. you're not alone. I mean, we are here to help you. We are here to connect you to services and supports. Um, there, like, there's so many, so much out there for, for Bucks County that you know, just reaching out and letting us know how you, we can help you is most important. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. I just realized I put them in the chat, but only to Jess, so that's not helpful. <laughs> so thanks for <laughs> sharing this. That's, that's for Jessica, that's it. <laughs> on the website, Jess. All yeah, right. We'll get everything up there. Probably uh, by the end of this week, everything will be posted on that link. It's lenapvf.org backslash free workshops. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Stop recording.